morning, everyone. Welcome to our presentation this morning. Um, it's Vicki Cowan, the president of the uh, St. John Naturals Club. Um, I have a couple of updates about the club before our presentation starts. I just want to say congratulations to everyone on the successful 60th anniversary celebration. Um, it was a real treat to have everybody together, including two founding members whom we could thank for their vision in establishing the club that we all enjoy today. It was a great, uh, great celebration. Um, I want to encourage people to watch for and uh, volunteer to, to host our wellness walks. It's a great, great chance to get outside and enjoy the company of others while enjoying our local trails. Um, if you're interested in doing that, just watch Facebook for the events. Or, and if you'd like to lead one, let Julie know and she'll help uh, with the advertising and the arrangements. I also want to say thank you to the volunteers and official counters for our projects at Greenlaw, PLBO and the Shorebirds. Um, these important projects enjoy uh, great support from our volunteers and, and funding partners. And as we wrap up uh, this year's counts, it's, uh, it's been great to be able to continue those important projects. Uh, one that's coming up that uh, we support and we, we're not responsible for, but support is the Christmas bird count. It's coming up quickly. So you can look for local events in St. John, Quispam, Cishampton, La Pro and St. Martin's. It runs from uh, mid-December to the 5th of January, and the newsletter has information on how to volunteer to participate. Uh, reminder, membership are due and can be paid online or by check. You can let Julie know in the chat on this call if you're interested, um, or uh, through Facebook, the website, or, or send her an email if you're interested in joining or need help uh, paying your dues. And on Saturday, December 17th, we have our annual members meeting. Uh, we're looking for one or two more presenters. Um, if anyone's interested in doing a short presentation, please um, contact Julie and um, let us know. We'd be happy to, to see your information. So for today's presentation, um, today's presentation is about um, Stonehammer Geopark and the Fundy Biosphere region. Uh, Patrick Sorensen and Emma Foster have kindly agreed to make the presentation today. The Fundy Biosphere designation by UNESCO provides not only international recognition for the uniqueness of the Bay of Fundy, its culture and history, but also emphasizes the importance of conservation and sustainability in the region. The Fundy Biosphere region includes over 430,000 hectares of the upper Bay of Fundy coast. And the Stonehammer Geopark is in the southern New Brunswick. It's a geological history going back a billion years. The Geopark is an area that holds all kinds of stories about our past, present, and future. It's a designation that attracts tourists wishing to explore the connections between geology, local communities, culture, and nature. And Stonehammer strives to showcase connections between our natural history and the diverse perspectives and experiences of our people and communities. So I'm certainly looking forward to hearing about both of, of those. Uh, our guest speaker, Patrick, is um, blessed to work with youth and other outdoor enthusiasts for the past decade to help them uncover the secrets that lie beneath the beautiful country of Canada. Patrick has six years experience producing programming for youth in a camp environment, one year representing Canadians at Walt Disney World, and over the past five years, he's been getting to know the glorious landscape of New Brunswick. Now, as the Education and Outreach Coordinator for Stonehammer Geopark, Patrick hopes to share his knowledge of this gorgeous landscape and true importance of fossil history with his community. And Emma has a background of photography, videography, and social media. She joined the Fundy Biosphere tier team in 2022 to help raise awareness for its existence and what they do. Day to day, she focuses on creating content, sharing updates on social media, as well as working on programming for schools to teach children about the biosphere. In her spare time, she enjoys hiking, camping, and exploring the Maritimes. She's currently in the process of building an off-grid home with her partner in the biosphere, of course. So that, Emma, sounds like an outing uh, for the future for the club. Come see your, uh, your new home. <laughs> So uh, participants, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat. Uh, Julie will uh, read them at the end of the presentation. And uh, 
Pam and Patrick, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, do the presentation this morning. And uh, Patrick, we'll hand it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick. I am the Education Outreach Coordinator, as we've said here. Um, and I've been with Stonehammer just this past summer, but I've been loving it and loving learning from uh, the geologists and paleontologists of our region. And, and uh, they've been teaching me a lot of good stuff. So I always like to start any talk about the geopark with the very concept that people don't really understand. What is a geopark? So I'm going to share my screen here and we will talk a little bit about that. So what we're looking at here is our 2,500 kilometers squared region that we encompass inside Stonehammer Global, Stonehammer UNESCO Global Geopark, I should say, because this is an internationally recognized space where geology and fossil history is extremely important to the education of, uh, of rocks in our little area here. What it really is in its core is it's a space that we do a lot of teaching about these important and significant finds that they've been finding here since as far back as 1834 when Abraham Gesner did his first geologic survey of the area. If you've heard of Abraham Gesner before, it's probably because he was the inventor of kerosene gas and would go on to create the petroleum gas industry. And so we would not be driving around in cars without a little help from geology in the past. So when we look at this map, St. John is right over here, if I can zoom in a little bit and you can see, we've got a lot of stuff mixed into just our city alone in the corner here. Uh, in St. John, being from, you guys have probably been to a lot of the locations that encompass our geopark. It's just a small piece of the very grand piece uh, pieces that we have inside our geopark. But sites include Reversing Falls, Dominion Park, uh, Rockwood Park, Irving Nature Park, a lot of parks. You're going to see some parks inside our geopark, our greater region. Um, and all of these different sites have different unique um, stepping stones that we sort of see through the geologic history going all the way back to that one billion year mark. So the fossils that we can find here sort of step along those those that sort of stairwell up to the grand big number that is 1 billion years. Yes, we have 1 billion years of stories and that's why we claim um, we claim this because we have a fossil that's actually right beside me and I'm gonna show later that is our oldest type of fossil. And, and with this huge range, we encompass almost every geologic period with only two exceptions and hopefully less soon. Uh, but the only periods we don't have are part of our dinosaur eras, so the Cretaceous and Jurassic periods. You won't be having any Jurassic Park stuff happening around here, at least. So with this in mind, we don't have many dinosaurs yet, but I always love to say yet because we have found dinosaurs in Nova Scotia and some of our uh, sister parks over there, like Cliffs of Fundy. And we also have found, uh, even recently, some uh, new finds in Prince Edward Island. So they're around us. Dinosaurs do exist exist in this region, uh, just not as prevalent as, say, farther out west, like in Alberta. And that's because the landscapes are just different. And our landscape is so unique. And that really comes down to a big collision that we had many, many years ago with a supercontinent called Pangaea. So one spot that you can visit and see where this big collision took place all those years ago is... Uh, at Rockwood Park, actually. So when Pangaea came together about 310 million years ago and solidified into the supercontinent that we know in our history, um, this is a huge sort of collision. And as these rocks went further upwards, that's why we have that huge cliff edge that I'm actually sitting close by to because I live close to Rockwood Park in St. John. Uh, and so these, these big rock edges and this cliff edge is a remnant of that collision. And if you look further inland and you go into the northern states as well, northeastern states, you'll start to find the Appalachian Trail, which began right here in St. John all those years ago. So this is just one of those cool things that sort of makes up why we have such diverse geology, because we had a huge collision of several continents all smacking together right here in our little city, which is so cool. Um, one of... If I could get it up here. 
we do many programs throughout our geopark. We're constantly um, getting to schools and doing education pieces with the community. This is our uh, geoscientist here uh, teaching some people just this past uh, um, National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. So this is Katrina Russell Dolan, who is the geoscientist that I'm currently uh, filling the shoes of during her maternity leave. But uh, she is uh, a fantastic person to learn from in geology. And so I try to echo her as best I can. But this is what we try to do. We try to get out to communities, do field trips with school groups, and uh, even go to large events like uh, the Sussex Balloon Festival, or I believe it's the Atlantic Balloon Fiesta, which I think is a phenomenal name. Uh, in Sussex, they throw these balloons up in the sky, which I'm sure many people are aware of. Uh, but we also were able to get there this year and showcase some of the fossils, which you can see on the tables here in the pictures. That's Katrina, that's Emma off to the side. Spoilers, you're seeing Emma early here. <laughs> but uh, this is... Um, just one of the many things that we do, we get out into the community. And in the past, that was really all we could do. We could get out and uh, and we didn't really have like a solid location. And this is kind of why if you have heard of the Geopark, but maybe not um, known too much about it yet, it's probably because we were just sort of popping up in different locations and trying our best to educate people. You know, for the majority of people that I've reached this summer, we uh, often see that the youth know a lot more than adults about uh, the geopark. And that's all due to this wonderful woman here, Katrina, who does her very best to inspire our youth. And I hope to echo that in the coming uh, new year. So with that in mind too, we are now a little different. We now have our own interpretation center, a visitor center right in Uptown St. John. If you were lucky enough to go down to the brand new Area 506 Container Village this past summer uh, and fall, you would have found us just hanging around talking about fossils all day long. And we actually were lucky to have a couple of fossils um, inside the container lent to us from the New Brunswick Museum uh, to show to the public about some of the new finds that have been found here. We actually had a lot of stuff um, that was found in the past decade uh, right inside the container. And that is the hope that we will, well, it is a guarantee that you'll see us again there next year uh, with some maybe new fossils, maybe some uh, some new finds if you've already visited before. And of course, our lovely staff will be there to educate anyone. So if you wanna come down to Water Street next summer and fall, you'll find us there all throughout the tourist season and uh, the cruise ship season, of course, too. So we were very excited to have that brand new thing for us to be able to reach the public. And whilst we were there this uh, summer and fall, we actually reached about 30,000 people. So you could be one of them next if you want to come by and visit with me next summer. Um, but other spots that you can visit, the Geopark is very immense. It's not just St. John, uh, but out, just on the outskirts of our city, we can see remnants of some of our geosites. Uh, or well, well, we can see the whole geosite, we'll say, but there's remnants of things from the past inside these geosites, of course. So one of the many, you might be looking at this and be like, this is kind of a, a grody looking picture, Patrick. It's not super exciting to look at. Well, Actually, what we're seeing here is remnants of some of our more recent geologic history. So we had an ice age over the past 20,000 years it started to recede over our continent and scrape along our stones and rocks throughout the region. And so we see in Irving Nature Park on the west side of St. John, these glaciers pushing forward. So as they melt, they'll actually bring up sediments, rock, gravel and sand and then compress them into large walls of these sort of loose sediments called moraines. So that's what we're looking at right here. It is a moraine. And along with many other moraines in the city, like the whole upper west side of St. John, we can see that the glacial movement through here was so immense and dumped so ferociously into the water supply that it helped create a sort of sloshing effect in our tidal change. And it is a contributing factor to why we have such huge tides in New Brunswick. And so then at Irving Nature Park 2, we can see that there is not just these moraines, but also these compacted sort of, 
I believe it's about 350 million year old ranged rocks that we can find at Irving Nature Park at the bedrock, but then also tons of sediments along the sides of it. And it's a very cool spot at Taylor Island to go and explore. Of course, I'm sure being hikers, you guys would all know that. But some of the rocks in, that are found here actually contain uh, fossils of sea life that were brought up or potentially underneath that ice and glacial melt that was happening long ago. This is just one example of that. It's not the most exciting creature here, but what we're looking at is a brittle star, kind of an ancestor um, or at least part of the same sort of familia as the uh, starfish. So this is a prehistoric starfish from the past uh, 20,000 years. I believe this one is more close to 11,000, 10,000 area. Um, but these guys are just one of the many fossils. And actually, we were lucky to have a fossil down at our container this summer and fall uh, that was a small glacial marine snail that was about 10,000 years old. So I guess in that case, he was the only thing slower than a glacier. It was a poor little snail. So sometimes these guys get buried in the sediments and gravel and rocks that are being pushed up by these glaciers if they're not fast enough to get out of the way. So that's one of my fave geosites in our city. But then we also have stuff further uh, to our sort of southwest. This is at the edge of our geopark at Lepro Falls. You've probably visited it before. Lepro Falls is a wonderful place to uh, see these beautiful waterfalls, but also inside these rocks. Not that there's a lot of fossils here, but we can find some really cool amphibian life that was long ago. About 325 million years ago, we see tetrapods. So these are four-legged amphibian creatures wandering through the muds and waters back in those days. And this is just one of the many kinds of fossils that we can find all around our geo sites. Uh, we also have places like St. Martin's at the other end of our geo park on the eastern, northeastern side. And really cool thing about St. Martin's, and Emma will touch on this later too, is that it's the intersect point of our geo park with the Fundy biosphere. So it's the only place in North America where a biosphere and a geo park combine in the same space. So it's really cool that we have like this joint space and that's why we work so closely together. Um, but the rocks here are about 250 million years old in the sea cave portion. And then just to our left, as we look at this sort of conglomerate on the far left side of the photo here, you see uh, sort of a bunch of different rocks sort of scattered together. And that is also from a, an ancient river that pushed through here and solidified these rocks into the walls, which is very cool. And I mean, it's also a great example of uh, shifting of plates because if everything was perfect with rocks, they would just be from bottom all the way up to the top. But with these rocks, it's never perfect. And so sometimes they'll get janked up to the side and they, they kind of are a little bit jarring, a little bit sideways diagonal. And so we can see that these rocks are older with the cave piece because they're actually underneath of these guys here. They were sort of forced upwards, which is kind of a cool thing. Then we also have a place farther north. So this is close to Norton at the Moosehorn Creek area is one of our other geosites at the far north part of our park. And alongside uh, the rock face here, we can find stuff found in our uh, rocks that are not really rocks at all. At least they weren't back in the day. They looked more like this when they were alive. So this is called a lepidodendron. Uh, it's a fossilized tree from about 350 million years ago. And these forests uh, that were found here, and you may have heard about it because it was pretty big in the news a little while back. When they broke the highway through Norton area to make that brand new highway, they found a lot of these trees, about 700 in particular, of a whole fossil forest. Um, a lot of them overturned, but they went through a lot of trials and tribulations when they were still alive. There's evidence that there was scorching on their bark. So there was burn marks on these trees. And then on top of that, there was also um, just a compaction of these guys into rock and shale. And so uh, some sort of flood water came through and buried these trees in into silt and then eventually shale and then into the stone that we have there now. And when they broke the highway through, they found root systems, trunks, leaves and branches and other critters lying around these different spots. Unfortunately, there's not as much as there was before, uh, but there is still some cool spots to check out. And I'm actually going to go visit some uh, next week. So I'm excited to see it myself. Uh, this one is a little harder to find, though, but it's a very cool spot. And we have shown some of the fossils found there inside our container. And we hope to do that again next summer. 
Um, another spot that we cannot go without talking about inside our geopark is right in the heart of our city at our river, the Willistook or the St. John River. This is Reversing Falls. So when we look at this picture here, um, we're not really looking at the water, let's say, but we're looking at the rock face. So there's two different sections of rock here. We have a limestone marble in this white gray rock here right beside the bridge. And then in this dark brown black rock, we have a sandstone and shale. These two pieces are about 500 million years apart in age. And they're remnants of continents left behind. Actually, the fault line where these continents broke off from when Pangaea split about 250 million years ago is right here. It's this big clump of rocks that are coming down this way. That fault is no longer active. If you're wondering where our closest fault line is, you'd have to go to Iceland. That is the closest one, and it passes right through the Atlantic. It continues to diverge as it's spreading apart about three centimeters a year, which is the same rate as your fingernails grow, if you <laughs> were thinking about that. How fast do they go, these tectonic plates? So these tectonic plates, they broke apart all those years ago, but when they separated, they left behind pieces of the old plates. So what was formerly... Africa or Gondwana before that, if you know some of the old uh, continents before we became Pangaea, is this piece of sandstone and shale that is from Morocco in Africa. And then to its right is we have a piece of South America inside this marble and limestone. And these two pieces are uh, connected to North America. So if you were just hanging out on that side of the bridge, you'd be standing on three different continents all at once. So we often talk about this place because people love to learn about that kind of cool facts that we've got there. But also the fossils that can be found inside these two types of rocks are what show us the age of them. So our younger of the two is our kind of famous fossil around here. So this guy is a trilobite. So what I'm what you're looking at here is the a legitimate fossil of a trilobite, not a Canadian one, unfortunately, but trilobites are small ancient invertebrates or crustaceans that lived about 500 million years ago to 250 million years ago. So when that continent actually split apart, it likely would have caused a massive drought on the planet, killing a ton of sea life. And unfortunately, trilobites were one of those receiving creatures. Now, trilobites are on the Stonehammer symbol. So when you look at our logo, you might see a little bit of that trilobite shape in it. But these guys are um, famous here in St. John due to uh, one of the largest trilobite fossils ever being found here in St. John. So in 1886, a young man named Will Matthew, a 14-year-old young boy, uh, found a fossil that was about the size of a dinner serving plate. Uh, and these guys... Uh, this, these guys, well, Will Matthew was uh, part of a organization called Steinhammer Club, along with his father, George Matthew, and many other geologists that were looking for fossils in this region. He would go on to get into university the year afterwards. So the young guy was a, a really smart cookie, that's for sure. But these, uh, these trilobite fossils, um, and this particular one that we found, not this one that we're looking at here, it's just a picture, a depiction of what they could have looked like. But the fossil that was found, and when you can see in our container next year, uh, this was the largest for about 100 years until 1999, when they have found one in northern Manitoba in Churchill area, that is currently just underneath a meter. So they can get quite big. And that's crazy because these, these little crabs is basically what they are. Crustaceans can go all the way down to the tip of your fingernail too. So this is one of the fossils that we have at the falls inside that sandstone piece. So then the marble to its right, we can find our oldest types of fossils. This is our big guy. This is a stromatolite. So what you're looking at here are basically little lines of stacking single-celled bacteria called cyanobacteria. These guys clumped together into large columns of slime and gunk and then formed into something that looks kind of like this here. 
uh, this cyanobacteria was responsible for producing oxygen, and it was the first thing to do so on our planet. We were the first to find stromatolites here in 1890 in Dominion Park, which is right in the north end of St. John. And in the future, they found older ones in other parts of the world up to 3 billion years old. So more than half the lifespan of it's expected that the planet has been around. Then... On top of that, if you're thinking that that's already pretty crazy enough that we have a three billion year old life form in fossil history, we also have fossils, uh, the, the living variety of these stromatolites still in Bermuda and Australia along their coastlines. You can find these critters still kicking to this day. Now, granted, they won't be producing enough oxygen for us to be able to breathe nowadays, but they were some of the first to get that sort of ball rolling. So we have them to thank in our fossil history. So all this to say, we have a ton of different fossils around here. And if I can leave you with anything today before I pass it off to Emma, is that fossils are protected by all of Canada. It's a federal protection. And in New Brunswick in particular, we would urge you not to take any fossils home with you. So if you do find a fossil, my uh, sort of list of things to do is leave it where it is, call the New Brunswick Museum, and mark your location, take a picture of it, do as much information gathering as you can before without touching it and without removing it from the space. Let them know. And then if you potentially found an important fossil, you might be recognized for that fossil forever. They will also track it for you. So you will get to know where it is at all times. So you can uh, follow it or go and see it when it goes back into a museum and is able to be viewed. So this is all cool things. And, you know, just like Will Matthew, even in the present day, we have fossils being found by 14 year old young lads, too, as we had one just found in St. Martin's in 2020. And he did almost all the right things, with the exception that they took it home only because there was a hurricane coming. So this was kind of a doing the wrong thing for the right reasons kind of thing. But we're lucky that we still have some of these fossils. So at the very least, if you are in good intent and trying to uh, protect our fossils, that's what we're hoping for. And we depend on people like yourselves that are interested and uh, that want to learn and want to protect our, our history that lies just underneath our feet. So, um, and I, if I haven't already said, you are all very lucky to be part of, uh, of Stonehammer only because that we are the first geopark in all of North America. So we're the first and we're, I think one of the coolest, <laughs> but that might just be a little bit of my stone talk in here. I don't know, <laughs> but thank you guys so much for listening to me talk. And if you have any questions, just throw them in the chat um, and I'll try and answer them after Emma's finished as well. So I'll pass it off to Emma Foster, our biosphere region and let us know what's going on over your way, Emma. Good morning, everybody. Um, I will be sharing my screen in a second here. Just get Patrick to take his down. There we go. Um, and same as Patrick, this uh, whole time, if you guys have any questions, definitely just pop them in the chat um, and we can go over it from there. So my name is Emma. I've been with the with the Fundy Biosphere just since the summer doing their uh, a lot of their social media, their content creation. Um, and kind of trying to find ways that we can better spread awareness like webinars like this um going into schools and that kind of stuff um so kind of as said by vicky there in the introduction the fundy biosphere region is a unesco designated site um so kind of similar to Stonehammer, uh, but we focus on mostly the flora and the fauna so like the plants and the animals um as well as the environmental impacts um, we have as humans and uh different ways we can focus on improving those things um and also cultural heritage. So we do have a couple of sites that do uh, focus on that as well and how that made a difference in uh, our landscapes. Um, so our main projects currently uh, consist of Forest of the Future, Trash Talks, Make Trails Count, and Amazing Places. So I'm kind of going to touch lightly on three of those, but we're going to focus on our amazing places. Um, as avid hikers and outdoor enthusiasts, those are probably what you're most interested in, uh, places to check out. Um, we're... Funny Biosphere, we're a small team uh, 
in the Moncton region is kind of where our, our head office is. But the biosphere itself spans, as Vicki said, 430 hectares of space. Um, I describe it as kind of starting down in St. Martin's, overlapping with uh, the geopark. And we reach up uh, through uh, Fundy Park, up through Hillsboro, uh, Moncton Riverview, Dieppe uh, Central Area, and then down to Sackville to the New Brunswick border with Nova Scotia. So it's quite a large area, um, kind of picturing it encompassing around um, the Petticodiac River as it comes in from the Bay of Fundy. So we have a lot of uh, interesting sites and things to do in that area. Um, so I'll kind of focus first on uh, the Forest of the Future project. So this is Nigel in these photos here. Um, he is our uh, forestry guy. So he does a lot of our tree planting for us. Um, we have projects. Um, we work with like the city of Moncton, the town of Riverview, village of Salisbury to plant on public land. Um, so we're trying to focus on getting trees into the ground. We're kind of, I think this was our last week because it's now quite frosty outside this morning. Um, but we had a goal this year of 5,000 trees, which I think they hit yesterday, if I am correct. Um, so working with the different villages and towns in the area to plant where we can. Um, we had a couple of different rural areas we were planting in, a couple of different parks we were planting in. Um, fortunate to work with some companies uh, we reached out to and they reached out to us. Um, we worked with a law firm. We got them out there one afternoon uh, helping us plant out of one of the public parks in Riverview. Um, so that project is uh, really fun, a lot of outdoorsness for us and improving the environment at the same time. The next project I'll quickly touch on is uh, Trash Talks. So this is a project that focuses on waste management through action, education, and research. Um, so we actually recently, we partnered with Acadia Toyota, which is one of the dealerships here in Moncton, and took one of their hybrid vehicles out to some of the less touched areas in our biosphere um, to work on picking up some trash. So those are the photos you're seeing um, right now. Um, we went to Slack's Cove, which is one of our amazing places, um, pictured in the first photo there, as well as Johnson's Mills um, in the second photo there, um, which are two beachy areas that aren't super trafficked. They're not the kind of beach you necessarily go to in the summertime, um, but a lot of waste um, from the fishing industry, a lot of waste from rural individuals who are out there more often um, that we were cleaning up. So we had a lot of, um, like I said, fishing industry stuff that washes up, lobster bands, fishing net material, fishing rope material, as well as unfortunately, you know, the typical beer cans. Um, we even had a bunch of aerosol uh, spray cans we found that day and, uh, and kitty litter, oddly enough. So we definitely try to get out and clean up when we can. Uh, the, over the summer, they were the team was also able to put on a garbage swim, they called it, in a review at one of the public pools where they filled the um, filled the public pool with clean garbage um, as a visual representative for some of the community to see how much uh, it can take up space. Um, and they had a couple activities for kids and some educational things going on um, with that. And it kind of helped visualize the pollution for the community of what that really looks like that we might not see, you know, firsthand every day, especially living in town. Um, the last one I'll speak on before heading into the uh, amazing places is Make Trails Count. Um, so this is Clarissa in these photos. She's one of our project managers as well. Um, she helps uh, communities and municipalities understand the usage of their trails. So what she's doing in these photos is uh, updating uh, our trail counters. So they're uh, infrared technology that basically can scan and uh, and see when movement goes by. So uh, as people walk through the trails, these are typically at trailheads. Um, we can collect the data on how many people are entering that those trails and those parks. Um, so this helps communities figure out, okay, when is the busiest time of day, busiest time of week, of year, et cetera. Um, and this also helps um, greater communities like the Biosphere region understand what parks are overused and what parks are underused. Cause that's a big thing we're looking at um, in this day and age is that there's a lot of places that are so high traffic um, that it can be detrimental to the environment. And there's some places that are so low traffic like those trash cleanup beaches where th things are happening that people aren't there to see, aren't there to help. Um, so we're trying to use this data to help even out that playing field with, um, 
you know, pushing more uh, marketing, pushing more awareness towards those underused uh, trails, beaches, and places. Um, so next we're gonna kind to jump into the amazing places. Um, in the background of this photo is Cape and Rage uh, down towards the Fundy Coast um, before you get right into Fundy Park, but very, very close. Uh, it is a beautiful area with lots of fossil history, um, which is, we don't really do geology, but I, if you're interested in that with what Patrick was saying, um, there's tons of cool stuff there. Uh, you can, if you're interested, go zip lining, go rock propelling. Um, it's a really interesting site. And there is, of course, also uh, safe stairs down to the beach areas. You don't have to rappel down the side of the side of the cliffs um, to check out the cool uh, geology um, and the history in that area as well. They have like a full time staff over the summer that is actually there. Um, to help educate and kind of uh, give a perspective on what's going on up there. So that is a really cool place in our amazing places. So this is kind of a visual uh, representative of the Fundy Biosphere region. So our 50 amazing places are all throughout this region. Um, we obviously have a very dense uh, collection in the kind of St. Martins and Fundy Park areas just because there's so much awesome stuff down there. Um, but we do spread up through Petit Kodiak, like I said, Hillsboro, Riverview, Moncton, Dieppe, and then down to Sackville. Um, so this is kind of our, our newer marketing we, we got done this year to kind of visually represent that. Um, and uh, we do have a version of this that has all the little pins and the list of the amazing places as well um, that we are working on pushing out. So when you can uh, get those maps and you can have a visual with you, a brochure um, to check out those areas. Um, so we'll jump into, obviously, I don't have time to cover all 50 amazing places, um, but I'd love to jump into five of my favorites. Uh, and I tried to kind of pick five that were a bit spread out over the region, not just dense into one area. Um, so some of these might be places that you wouldn't necessarily go to just for an afternoon. If you're in the St. John region, it might be more of a trip up to the Moncton region. Um, to see some of these, but it can make for a great weekend adventure. Um, if you went, if you camp in the region at all, there's tons of things to do uh, when you're in this side of the province. So the first I'm going to speak on is Fort Bordesjour, which I discovered that many people don't know about. Um, it's a historic site, and it's actually, if we pop back into here, um, it's in the Sackville region. So you're going to go just past Sackville, almost to the border, uh, in a little area called Olac. Um, and that's where Fort Bourgeois is. So at the historical site, you have, as you see in the first photo, um, some of the remnants of what was there, um, the fort itself. And then you also have these beautiful rolling green hills. Um, in the summertime, again, this is a staffed uh, area that you can you know, get lots of interpretative information from, um, but it's fun to explore too on your own, walk around. Um, there's tons of little like kind of outposts and little buildings and the property itself, it goes all the way down to the water. Um, the part of this that's picked as an amazing place is because down along the water, so the third picture is kind of more closer to the Petticodiac uh, in, in the basin itself there, um, they have what was called abuatos. So abuatos, um, they are an Acadian farm tool, we'll kind of briefly call it. Um, basically, they would build dikes along the marshy area in this air in this, uh, the Fort Beaujolais area. And because the salt water coming in from the basin wasn't proving to be very good for farmland, um, they created these dikes which blocked the water at high tide and through the dikes almost like a little tunnel with a gate. Um, so at low tide the water could actually drain out of the marshy area but at high tide the salt water couldn't get back in. So they had a whole system of draining the water um, out without letting more back in and created these very fruitful very sustainable farmlands for their area. Um, so that's kind of where this falls into the amazing places. Um, historical part. Um, so this was a very important area back then, and it created acres and acres of sustainable farmland for their community village uh, at the time. Um, it's a really interesting spot. And if you enjoy walking, which I'm sure a lot of you do, um, there's endless amounts of, of parts to explore in this area, uh, right down to the water along the dikes. And they're fairly like flat, even ground as well. So um, very accessible. Um, and, and a fun, just kind of different, different perspective of the area. The next one I'm going to touch on, um, this is Waterside and Dennis Beaches. So those are down kind of um, past Riverside Albert, as you get kind of more towards the Fundy Cape and Rage area. 
they are kind of off to the side off of the main route on the coast it's a beautiful area of beaches um there's two that kind of intersect they have beautiful beautiful sandy areas beautiful rocky areas um i've been down there and people are actually uh, sea bass fishing right from the beach um which is really cool to sit and watch if you're interested in fishing at all um it's it's quite the quite the thing to see these areas are are I would say kind of medium populated. Um, we do have a lot of the rural community who uses them to camp, um, to have bonfires, to, to, to enjoy. And it is quite clean down there. It's, it's very nice how well taken care of the area is um, for being so far out of the way, out of the cities. Uh, but it is a, a very beautiful area to go. Um, it is very quiet as well. I find every time I've been down there, it's not a beach again that you would necessarily be top of your list <laughs> to go to in the summertime if you want to swim and tan. Uh, but it is a, a great, great area, you know, to go for a stroll, to look for sea glass, look for fossils, um, take your dog for a walk. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. And, uh, has quite the interesting stretch of um, kind of a rocky beach to a sandy beach, uh, as well as kind of the mud flats if you venture out at low tide as well, which can reveal some really cool stuff too. Um, so a great beachy area to visit if you are um, near Fundy Park uh, or, or near that kind of Riverside Albert area as you head down. I guess very soon, probably in about 10 days actually, all this area is going to kind of be renamed Fundy Albert anyways, so it's kind of one greater area, um, but it, it is a really different beach to go to, um, and people who know about it, locals who have been going there for, you know, dozens of years, only have good things to say about it. it it's truly an amazing place for a reason, <laughs> uh, and uh, a great stop, um, you know, picnic or anything like that if you are road tripping through the area. The next one here, um, you don't have to be as daring as this fella to, to visit this place. Um, this is Crooked Creek Look Off. Uh, it's another one of our amazing places. It's pretty much right in Riverside, Albert, um, in, in the town there. It's a really interesting spot. The Look Off itself is one of our amazing places. And um, I'll tell a quick story, actually. My first time going to this area, I was looking for a waterfall. Um, and I hiked up a trail that started on the main road. It was probably about an hour hike. wasn't anything too crazy, but enough that it was a little bit of work. And I get up and I get to the top and come out of the forest into this opening. And I see this little kind of green, as you can see down in this first picture, uh, like viewing deck. And I'm like, what's that over there? And I walk over and this breathtaking view of these rolling hills. Um, it was also in the fall that first time I went, you see the colors. And I could not believe I was still in New Brunswick. I was like, this is stunning and I've never heard of it ever this is probably six or seven years ago now um but it's it's a gorgeous gorgeous area um and it's also very accessible so you have that hiking trail like I said from the main road if you wanted to you know go a little bit more into it um it's not a super difficult trail but it's definitely not a uh, taken lightly trail either it is quite steep in some areas um but luckily this specific lookout has a road right to it. Um, the road is a little steep uh, and it is gravel at, at one spot. So definitely um, make sure you uh, have the right tires on, uh, have the right speed going up and all that. But up to the top of the hill, tons of parking, picnic tables. There are outhouses. I've never personally used them, but at your own discretion and this beautiful, beautiful view. Um, the, the, the deck you see here is actually quite large. Um, I wanna estimate maybe like 10 by 15 feet rectangle and uh, it has a little bench area as well to sit on and it's a gorgeous area to, to kind of take in the view um, you can kind of see in that second photo to the center of this valley there's al actually a river that goes through or, or creek I suppose <laughs> crooked creek um, and it actually leads down to uh, a waterfall that trail is kind of before you hit the steep hill up the road there's a trail to the left definitely a difficult one um not an easy one to take on it's quite steep going down and then extremely steep coming back out of course uh, but a beautiful waterfall down in that area as well uh, if you're up for the challenge and uh, again an area that I would say medium traffic there is a four-wheeler trail on the other side of this creek so you do get a little bit of um, the campfire residue uh, burn pits the uh, beer can sometimes unfortunately um but in my opinion the more well trafficked it is with 
hikers and people who are interested about the environment, the cleaner it's going to be anyways. Um, so if you do want to venture down there, it is a beautiful, beautiful waterfall. I've been in winter in uh, February, much more difficult when it's icy. And uh, I've also been in summer uh, for a place to take a nice cool dip as well. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous area that I couldn't believe the first time I saw this place that it wasn't talked about more. Um, so I'm really glad that it is on our 50 amazing places. Um, the next place is actually quite close to Crooked Creek as well. This is in Hillsboro. It's called White Rock Recreational Area or Park, depending who you ask. Um, and it has these giant white rocks from gypsum mines in the area. Um, this is obviously a no longer active area um, right here, but there's tons of walking trails. It's very, very close, actually kind of encapsulated around um, the golf course down there as well. So if you are interested in golfing, this is a great area where you could have some hiking adventures uh, as well as having that uh, golfing uh, afternoon dinner kind of situation. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful area, great walking trails. Um, it can be kind of busier in the summertime. It is actually mainly a, a mountain biking park. Um, so a lot of the trails are shared trails, um, which is important to keep in mind, especially in the winter, um, making sure anything that's cross country skiing versus hiking versus fat biking, making sure you're not uh, uh, altering or damaging those trails for those who use them. But um, it's a great area to go through. Anytime I've been, I've actually never seen any mountain bikers there, um, but I do know uh, many mutual friends that do mountain bike and talk very highly of this area. So if that is something that you're interested in, um, definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, and again, for the walking trails alone, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. And in this third picture, You'll see actually um, this park wasn't originally a park, obviously it was farmland and uh, and pr private properties uh, owned by families and a mastodon uh, fossil was actually found there in 1936. Um, so that kind of helps tie us into the geopark as well, talking about what Patrick was talking about, um, for fossils in the area. Um, this mastodon, he was about half fossilized. Um, Assumingly, he would have gotten stuck in a mud pit type scenario, um, couldn't get out uh, and would eventually have either dehydrated, uh, starved, uh, whatever would have succumbed to that. Um, so about half of him that got into that mud uh, was actually fossilized. So when it was discovered in 1930 or 1936, um, they were able to recover a good portion of it in the actual fossilized pieces and uh, they actually were able to fully reconstruct it and it was on display at the New Brunswick Museum in St. John so you might have actually seen him or her before um, but now unfortunately with the museum being closed you can't go check it out now uh, but it's it's a really cool find for this area that just kind of shows the history um, as you see on the sign here um, the average was about 75,000 years ago um, so that just kind of shows and dates back, you kind of forget what might have happened in the past, um, but what was here and what was living uh, and breathing and uh, existing in our area, it's kind of cool to picture a mastodon, which if you don't know, uh, is kind of related to the woolly mammoth, but they're almost like cousins, they're not the exact same, they had different diets um, and different kind of uh, like face head shapes as well, uh, as well as being different sizes, but they do get confused sometimes. <laughs> um, those are some important things I've learned from the Geopark, uh, working at the Balloon Fiesta with uh, Katrina and also working events with Patrick, um, definitely upping my uh, geology and fossil knowledge that way, um, which is great that we're able to collaborate and kind of teach each other more in that regard. So the last amazing place I'm going to speak on is um, Laverty Falls, but this is kind of a bonus one because it loops around with Moosehorn, which is um, a separate trail and a separate amazing place, but you can do the hike as a loop or you can just do one or the other in and out. Um, so Laverty Falls is a beautiful family-friendly waterfall. It uh, is a pretty steady decline, just like a slow decline down into the falls. So coming back out kind of sucks a little bit, uh, taking many breaks if needed for sure, making sure you have water and snacks with you. But it's a beautiful area. It's about two and a half kilometers down to the falls from the trailhead in Fundy Park. Um, and when you get down there, tons of space to, you know, sit and have like a snack, some lunch. There's usually quite a few people there. Um, it is a trail that, you know, I've seen, you know, people my age, 20s and 30s doing. I've seen, you know, five-year-olds in Crocs <laughs> doing this hike, as well as uh, people, you know, of older generations, 50s, 60s. It's a very, very family-friendly area. And one of those higher trafficked areas that I was speaking about earlier where 
we have really, really low traffic versus really, really high traffic uh, hiking areas. So a beautiful, beautiful spot and probably one of the most popular trails in Fundy Park. Um, and it loops through, so this kind of riverbed you're seeing, the, the water kind of goes down and the trail loops around back to the same trailhead. Uh, and then you're entering the Moosehorn Trail uh, territory there. And it has beautiful pools and like large boulders and really interesting uh, how the waterway was formed through there. Um, the moose horn side of the hike is a lot more difficult. I think it's about three and a half, three and a half kilometers one way. So if you did like the two and a half to Laverty and then it'd be another three and a half to go through moose horn back to, uh, the trail head, um, a little bit more difficult, a little bit more, um, varying like steep to flat to incline kind of areas um but a beautiful hike nonetheless it's actually the first hike I ever did um when I was I think it was probably 19 or 20 and I was you know kind of first out on my own and uh a friend took me down to Fundy and I had never really been hiking before I don't come from that kind of background and I was just blown away I fell in love with it since it is definitely not an easy hike but it was worth it and feeling that exhilaration um the like you know accomplishment of doing it as well um and it was a great time it was a fall day i think it was like late september uh beautiful beautiful time to visit for sure um fundy park has tons of trails to focus on um this is just one of the many there's probably probably almost a dozen amazing places actually fall within the fundy park area um so another great great uh option that's maybe a bit closer to you guys if you are more in saint john um so kind of wanted to close up with um how Fundy Biosphere Region and how Patrick uh, at Geopark, uh, Swinhead Geopark are kind of related. Um, so this first photo here is actually me and Patrick a few weeks ago. We worked an event at Resurgo Place, which is the museum in Moncton. Um, so as Patrick said, his area, the Geopark, goes down to St. Martin's. And actually our area starts in St. Martin's. So we're actually the only place in North America that has two UNESCO designations that overlap like that. Um, which is really interesting that you don't see that as often, but it's kind of cool how we can share the culture, share the education, the geology, and how it all fits together, um, I think is really awesome and amazing. And the other cool thing you see here on the other photo of, of the lovely woman on the, I guess it's my right, I'm not sure if it's your left or right. Um, this is Jennifer. So she's actually the both of our executive directors. Um, she's amazing to work for, uh, amazing to work with. Um, this is her actually on that uh, garbage cleanup we did a few weeks ago at those uh, uh, less traveled beaches. Um, so she's the executive director for the Fundy Biosphere Region here in Moncton. Um, she works in my office, but also she is the executive director for the Stonehammer Geopark and works very closely with Patrick and Katrina um, and their summer students as well to um, support them on that front too so the interesting thing about this is that from we, what we understand so far we have not come across it is she is the only uh executive director in the whole unesco international uh committees communities etc that she is the same like one executive director for both areas so we are not only the only place in north america where two overlap we're the only place in the world with the same executive director so that's kind of uh kind of cool kind of fun it, it really helps our collaboration as well having her kind of facilitate um you know for instance this resurgo event a uh, picture here of me and patrick um she was like, oh, Emma, I'm going to get you to do this. And then last minute, we're like, oh, you know what? Patrick's jumping on this too. And like, we were able to collaborate because we're kind of all one big team. Um, same as today's webinar, um, being able to have Jennifer, you know, introduce me and lead me into this as an option. Like, oh, you should jump on this webinar um, with Patrick. Uh, it is great, great uh, ways to communicate and kind of build our, our communities and connect the whole south side of the province pretty well. Um, so that's been really, really awesome having her as that kind of pillar in between the two uh, designations. Um, that's all I really had for today. I guess we'll hand it over to Julie, um, I'm not sure, I'll stop screen sharing here, uh, but if there was any questions in the group chat for uh, me and Patrick. So I'm just noticing some of our uh, questions here in the chat so far. Uh, so Vicki had a great question about um, what resources do we have? Um, so I would definitely recommend going to our website, which I've just put into the chat just now. 
Um, that is a wonderful resource to learn about any of the public accessible sites. I should have mentioned earlier, but there's technically 60 sites within the geopark. Not all of them are so accessible. This is only due to the fact that we don't really want people at some of the ones where fossils are really, really exposed out. Um, and that sort of ties into the next part of your question, Vicky, is how do we identify a fossil when we see one? Well, most of the public and even myself, I'm not like really well versed in every fossil in the world. And even our geoscientist has said, I don't really want to claim anything is something without seeing it and closely inspecting it. And so that's the same for you. If you find what you think might be a fossil, then just follow all the same procedures as before. Leave it where it is. Mark your location, take a picture of it, and send as much of that information as you can off to the New Brunswick Museum. They will come and inspect the site and check it out. Uh, if you think it looks like anything, could be leaves, could be animal tracks, could be the remnants of an animal, unlikely to see too many bones. It's a very, very rare find in our area, at least. Most of them are found in the rocks. But uh, all the same, you know, if you think it looks like something, just stop and follow those things. Mark your location, check it out, all that good stuff. Yeah, uh, I don't know if there's any other questions for me here. I think there was, oh, there was a thing about Jessica Doyle in here. Yes, her drawings are really wonderful. I completely agree with you. I It just made me think of something when you said that, uh, is that this picture here, I hadn't showed it in my part of the presentation, but this one is of the flower pot that unfortunately fell down during, I believe, Hurricane Dorian in 2019. And this flower pot uh, is on the Funny Trail Parkway that's just beyond St. Martin's. Funny thing about it is that that drawing made by Jessica Doyle, and this isn't me being like Jessica, some supernatural being, was made prior to the flower pot falling down. So I don't know, some weird premonition things <laughs> happening there, but just a fun little aside. Uh, so that's just kind of cool about that stuff. So uh, I do think there was a question for you in here, Emma, too. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so I saw the question there from Vicky, I believe, um, about the boundaries of the biosphere. Now, I won't lie and say things I don't. I don't honestly know who and how decided the boundaries. Um, I know that we've been designated for about 15 years, though. Um, so long before I was part of the part of the workforce, unfortunately. Um, but it doesn't extend down to St. Stephen because the difference of the area. So the area we're focusing on is the Fundy Biosphere region is unique in itself. And while, you know, there's nothing against the St. Stephen area, it has different stuff, right? So the projects and the specific things that we are focusing on um, are encompassed in that region. Again, I don't know 100% who decided the, the, the boundaries or the exact area, um, but I do know that, you know, just like you'd say the difference of why uh, it's different than the West Coast in, entirely of Canada, there's just different stuff there, right? Um, so that's part of it, I believe, um, as well as um, I don't know how much in hand it's locals versus internationals who have to do with the UNESCO uh designation um but i'm sure there was many hours of back and forth and communication on how exactly they were going to cookie cut this area and i do know that it focuses on that upper bay of fundy uh you know ecology um so that is partial to it um the other thing i saw in here uh bridget said the trash talk project you mentioned is very interesting yes so um it's been really fun working on that project and also on my side of it being able to find people to work with, collaborate with, um, in getting some of those cleanups, uh, done and focusing on educating the public as well, uh, in the same, in the same time. I'm just going to kind of go over the chat. A few more things were added. I got something here, Emma, then. Uh, I just, uh, to piggyback on top of what Emma's, uh, saying here too, for like the geopark in particular, um, for us, it's all about like where the rocks um, have geologic significance that's really and the diversity sits. So em Emma has touched on a lot of different other fossils that are outside the geopark. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, why isn't that all part of it? Well, maybe someday. But at the time, about 12 years ago in uh, 2010, when they first uh, created this geopark, uh, the pieces, the 60 sites and all these different places where we could find those fossils is what made up the region and the space around it. But 
there's there's a little less diversity as you start to, to leave that zone. Not to say that there isn't still fossils that can be found, but just not as much of this diversity that we see. And I noted that uh, Matt Stimson, who we were talking about down here at the bottom, did a little trip for you guys. That's wonderful. He's a fantastic resource. It's actually funny you said he took you up to Norton because that's where he's actually going to take me next week. So just a funny little aside there. Anyways, back to you, Emma. Yeah, the only other one I see in here kind of towards the biosphere, John had asked what the status of logging in the biosphere. Um, I'm going to assume referring to like like wood lots and logging. Um, there is unfortunately a lot of deforestation. Um, and the more I go around with the biosphere the past couple months working there, it is very upsetting. Um, but it's not part of our current projects besides the fact that we're replanting trees. Um, but I'm not sure much about, honestly, the logging industry and, uh, and where it sits, I guess, right now. Alrighty, well, um, thank you everyone uh, for your questions. And um, in particular, thank you, Emma and Patrick for your presentations. Um, and Patrick, your, your enthusiasm and sense of humor will, will charm the children you're planning on teaching about the geopark. Um, you, you have a knack for explaining the concepts of geology in a way that non-geologists are able to understand. Um, sometimes it's hard to understand the very large and very small scales of geology and fossils. Um, your comparisons to everyday items is really, really helpful. And also, I agree, Jessica's drawings are amazing, I'm sure. They, you know, they charmed us, and I'm sure the kids would uh, would love them as well. Um, and I hadn't heard about the fossilized forest at, at Norton. It's amazing they found so many fossilized trees. Um, and, and I was also interested in the three billion year old um, stroma, stromatolites. Um, that's incredible, and it's it's yeah. great that they were found here in first in Dominion Park. I think that's yeah. In 1890 is when they found them, and ours I should reiterate are one billion years old. But um, just like you're saying, yes, there are some out there that are three billion years old. I think there's some even in the UK. I think are close to that date. But it, it's nice. crazy to think that there's something so old like that. <laughs> that's it. I sometimes feel that old uh, when I when I get up in the morning with bad joints but uh well I'm when you're surrounded by fossils old. like me uh, <laughs> you you never feel old I can promise you that much <laughs> well, that's it it was also a great reminder um to leave the fossils in place and and letting us know what to do when we do find find a fossil or think that we have that's uh, that's important information for those of us that are outside all the time and and Emma I really enjoyed hearing about the variety of, of places in the biosphere um, your suggestion to make a weekend trip to see some of those locations is a great idea. You know, we don't often behave as tourists in our own province. Um, and if we plan as if we were from away, maybe we would make the time and, and see the value of what, what is right on our doorstep. Um, you know, I'll definitely make a point of going to some of the places that, that you introduced us to. Um, Laverty Falls, I'm sure, is popular because uh, it is a great spot for, for kids to go enjoy a a fairly short hike and then uh, be able to play around the waterfall. So um, lastly, I just like to say it's wonderful how the two UNESCO organizations uh, cooperate and share the leadership. That's something I, I hadn't un understood. And um, I, we can see the value of, of the leadership being joint um, just in the presentation that you've given and the sharing of information and going out into the public um, to, to share the amazing things that you found. So thank you so much and thanks everyone for joining us on the call and hopefully we'll see uh, everyone at the members meeting next next month. Yeah, thank you so much on behalf of Stonehammer for inviting us. We really appreciate having a little chat with you guys today. And thank you so much as well from the Fundy Biosphere region for uh, inviting me on this call. I think it was a great educational time. <laughs>